pretty damn good, you know, the countryside of our country. It's not even compare it to the U.S. at all. Mm -hmm. Some, in some places like China, but it's a different world in North Korea. It's the most isolated country in the world. I think it's, people know the least about North Korean people. But as you go further north, and you see this in the documentary too, if you go further north along that border, mm -hmm. you get where there's more and more uh, you know, North Korean uh, people that have defected all of these years into the northern part of China. And all of the signs are not only in Chinese, but they're also in Korean as well. So this is completely a Korean um, culture in northern China as you go close to that border to the north. Well, speaking of defectors, this is a question I think a lot of people will have when they watch because you are so close. There is nothing but a bridge or a shallow body of water. Mm -hmm. Why don't more people defect? Well, you would be shocked. You know, why, why don't they get out of that country? One, it's, one, it's countryside, so mm -hmm. it's not like there's a big city right against that border. So it's mostly countryside and farming, agriculture. But you also know a couple of things. There have been defections over. Some because people are, even, even by military, even North Korean military have come uh, across. Mm -hmm. you know, part of it is they're underpaid and underfed. So they come over to eat and get some a different kind of life. And some of them go back. There are plenty of defectors that have come across that northern part of North Korea into the Korean area because they can then find a way out. Mm -hmm. There's you know, a lot of Christian groups that actually try to take some of these defectors and find them a way to right. get out, largely through China to the south, like into Laos, for example, then ending up in South Korea. But the main thing to remember is if, a, if somebody defects and they want to get across, even if they're not caught, they have family members back in North Korea, mm -hmm. and they would, they would almost for sure end up in a camp for re-education or even executed. There is another moment in this documentary that was striking to me, really for the nuance it provides, uh, which is when you were talking to a gentleman there in China about Kim Jong-un, who here in America is sort of yeah. the, the classic bad guy, right? He's crazy, he's unhinged, uh, that's how the, we talk about him here. But you asked that man, and he, he had a very nuanced answer. I just want to play that right now. <laughs> That's a prison right there? Kim Jong-un built this bridge? Why did Kim Jong-un want to build this bridge? For a war. Get ready for the war. So, Bob, what was that moment like? Give me the context of that conversation. Well, you know, the, the, you know China's view of what's happening in North Korea and this, and this increasing tension is sometimes they blame it on the U.S. and South Korea stepping up the, uh, the, the joint operations by the military all of the peninsula area. Mm -hmm. So they think that they're angering North Korea and that's why Kim Jong-un is doing, cutting down relationships with China, has not opened some of these bridges. Um, there's been, you know, very uh, unpredictable relationship between Kim Jong-un and China is different than his father, Kim Jong-il, or his, certainly his grand, grandfather, Kim, Kim Il-sung. So China sees that a lot of this tension is one. Yes, they don't know a lot about Kim Jong-un, but they also blame the United States on a lot of this because we've maintained our influence within South Korea. And China doesn't want the United States to be so close to them. And they certainly don't want to get that buffer of North Korea of that regime to fall because they, China believes for sure that the, if that falls apart, South Korea, North Korea, uh, South Korea and the United States would push up maybe even against that border with China. Mm -hmm. And they would, they would like that a lot less than having a disastrous country of North Korea as it exists now. Well, I have a lot of questions for you. I should also say, for those of you out there on Facebook joining us, if you have questions, you can send them in right here. We are in conversation with none other than Bob Woodruff, who is the man behind a new ABC News documentary, An Inconvenient Border, where China meets North Korea. I have to say again, your timing is just incredible, though. I want to ask you, because we talk so often about U.S. and North Korea relations with this phrase, rising tensions, especially with this new administration. You've been reporting there for years and years and years. There's fabulous video in the documentary of a younger Bob Woodruff in the field in Pyongyang. How have you been viewing that relationship between the U.S. and North Korea? Well, I think of it as who's the, who's the great leader at the time. You know, if you looked at uh, all those years where Kim Jong-il uh, was in power, China had a huge power of influence over North Korea. 
They knew that Kim Jong-il didn't have the kind of strength that his father, Kim Il-sung, had, the mm -hmm. one who established North Korea, you know, shortly after World War II, which led into the Korean War with the United States. They knew that he was powerful. They knew that Kim Jong-il was one that continued to influence, that China could influence. So their relationship there was, was pretty strong because, again, they were able to have a country that was standing between you know, China and, and the U.S. Since Kim Jong-un came in, this has changed. There's much different relationship, and I said before, is because he's a, he is unpredictable. He has not come to China. He's not really interacted with, with Xi Jinping, even though his, his predecessors, you know, his father and his grandfather, have been there many times to China mm -hmm. um, because it's their only real ally. So China, it's changing completely. Twelve years ago, within North Korea, uh, the food was worse. The freedom of the people seemed to be worse. Mm -hmm. The advancement of the people were, was uh, the much not as modern as it is now. And you know that the, the technology within North Korea was nothing compared to what it is now. So you go in there, you can see, you know, you can see the, the women on, and the men with more Western clothes, the women have high heels on now you never saw before. You saw people have cell phones that they can talk to within Pyongyang, but it doesn't extend outside that city much. They can't talk on cell phones with people outside the country. Mm -hmm. It's maintained, it's isolated. Uh, and there's a lot of change in the wealth within Pyongyang, but that's the elitist center. And that's largely the only place they allow us to go to. We cannot go out to the countrysides. We can't see the camps. We can't see the areas of poverty. Right. So we can't see, we, we can't see a lot of North Korea when we're there, other than the ones that we've concentrated on. I mean, I was at one of the, the nuclear facilities in 2008. It was very rare. But that's when they're really negotiating uh, to try to end their their nuclear power. Mm -hmm. But that's fall apart. They're never, not, well, not to say never, but it's very difficult to get them to show us where they're doing their, their nuclear tests or their launches of missiles. Well, there is no one else who could tell this story <laughs> like you do. And I, I encourage folks out there to watch this as soon as they can. Before we let you go, a couple of Facebook questions coming in from people out there who are okay. tuning in. Beth has written uh, to ask, have you ever felt threatened during any of your visits there? I don't, I don't think I ever felt threatened. I know there's a couple moments where it, we all, I wouldn't say disobeyed with the minders. You know, the minders, are, they're, they're, there are guides that we cannot leave their side. You're assigned one as we're, soon as you come in, yeah, right? Yeah, we're always, we can't go and walk freely without them. Um, there's been moments where I went to places where they hinted or at least told us we should not go. But I would never stand up and say, don't tell me where we can't go and then just go there. If I did that, that would have been different. I mean, sadly, we know this, the, the case of... Uh, of Otto, you know, Warren Beer, as the American who was taken captive for doing something that seemed that they believed was offensive to their great leader Kim mm -hmm. Jong Un. If so, if we did something like that, that would be a completely different world. But I think we've been there so many times. We know how to dig for every piece of information we can and uh, try to shoot anything that had not been shot before, and learn everything we can about that country. But we generally know what the rules are, and so I've never felt threatened that way. And how but far we have you can push we them. have been you know been kind of you know taken aside and had to sit and be questioned and they took you've our, been detained they took you've, my phones yeah. I've been mm -hmm. detained and they yeah. took our phones and they looked through everything and they probably and they erased a lot of things in them a lot of times photographs really mm -hmm. that we took we were, I was I was not able to take photographs with my cell phone of soldiers in particular checkpoints and I did but I didn't know specifically that was one of the places and I sometimes I've taken some things that I knew they didn't want. But there's, yes, we were, we were questions many times and they've taken things from us. You mentioned Otto Warmbier. We have another question from Michelle uh, who asks, why didn't the U.S. government help the American who was detained and later died from his injuries? Why did not the American? Why didn't the U.S. government? I guess she's asking why wasn't more done? Well, why wasn't he able to be at least uh, earlier? You know what's really shocking is they didn't know about it for a year. The U.S. was never told. There are two different or groups within North Korea. Mm -hmm. There is the, the, the military and the security units mm -hmm. within North Korea, and then there's the foreign affairs, f foreign ministry, which is all the U.S. relationship is with them, including us when we, when we put our request to go to North Korea. We go through the foreign ministry mm -hmm. and the ones based in the United States, in, in New York. Um, there's no em em embassies, et cetera, in the United States from North right. Korea. The connection's all through, through the U.N. operations. Um, that's the only ones that uh, we connect with. And they, and, and our sources said this is really true, even the foreign ministry didn't know about what Otto Warmbier was going through. They had no idea. They had no idea. 
And so that's why the U.S. didn't even know about it until it was already for a long, for months and months, already in a coma. So when they finally found out, then they reached the point where the foreign minister could get together and try to, or maybe we can work out to get, mm -hmm. to get him back to the United States. So it was, uh, it was shocking to everybody, including with our, our own U.S. government, that this information was withheld. This is the last question I'll ask you before we let you go, I promise. Lisa is asking a question on everyone's minds these days, I think, particularly given mm -hmm. some of the comments over the last week or so. Uh, she's asking if you think that North Korea is in danger of starting a war. You know, I think we all, I wish we all knew this. One simple thing just to remember, though, is for the building of a nuclear powers with North Korea mm -hmm. is not to... Listen, this is all speculation, right? These are just our thoughts and experts that we've all spoken to. Mm -hmm. Is that North Korea is not wanting to invade and gain land. It does not want to get a new country. Right. I mean, they did that in, after World War II where the North wanted to take over the South, which was then forced back by the United States to the 38th port parallel. Right, doesn't make a lot of sense. But they also know there's a major threat to the regime, to the Kim Jong-un family. Mm -hmm. And the building of this gets two things for them. One, it tries to... You know, resist anything from happening where the U.S. would invade and get rid of Kim Jong-un or even underground through CIA operations. The other one, if they can create North Korea as a, as a nu nuclear state, that chains all negotiations with them. And that's the other thing that they're almost certainly trying to create themselves as a nuclear state. So that's fully done and they're named as one, then they changed uh, their position. And uh, I think the fear of them starting an invasion. Uh, most people believe that it wouldn't happen unless there's some triggering, there's some major threat of ending the regime. And that certainly can't be done through diplomacy, but it could be done through any massive operations outside, military operations outside of the country. But we just don't know. I mean, this is different than any other country. This is not the, you, you and I have done a lot of experience in in the, uh, the Middle East and those wars, but those were, at, those were wars Very between countries, countries that were, A, not, not our great allies. Yes. I mean, and no, there were not really major allies around those countries mm -hmm. like Afghanistan and, 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 and Iraq, mm -hmm. uh, but this is. All around North Korea is our close, close allies, the, you know, Japan and South Korea. So anything that happens within North Korea is going to affect them with uh, significantly. That's why we haven't done anything yet. Well, there is no country like it in the world, and there's probably no journalist who could tell this story the way you have. Bob Woodruff, congratulations. Well, it's an incredible so much, documentary. It's called An Inconvenient Border, where China meets North Korea. It is available right now on all ABC News platforms, or you can just download the ABC News app right now and watch it right on your phone or mobile device. Bob Woodruff, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks to all of you for watching as well. Head over to abcnews.com anytime for more on this story or download the ABC News app for the latest right to your phone. For now, I'm Amna Nawaz and I'll see you back here soon.